All right, everyone, I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. Welcome to this talk. Our speaker is Jim Sikoski, and Jim's going to talk about water, water, water on Mars. Take it away, Jim. Hi, I'm Jim Sikoski, a retired teacher. I'm here to show you where water was on Mars and where ice is today. I'm grateful to have been able to use the Hubble Space Telescope, the Mars Global Surveyor, and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter as an amateur. NASA allowed me to suggest places to look at with high rise. People often ask how I get interested in science and space travel. Uh, when I was a kid in the 50s, I was um, I really enjoyed the movies. Uh, Forbidden Planet was my favorite. I also liked uh, Conquest of Space and Destination Moon. Uh, at the same time, Walt Disney teamed up with Werner Braun Braun uh, to produce a series of uh, programs about space travel. Uh, Walt Disney illustrated uh, physics principles with his cartoon characters in a way that a kid could understand. Uh, first, a little bit of history of our exploration of Mars. Uh, we've been excited by Mars for uh, quite some time. Uh, we started to explore it in the 60s. Our, our first missions, our first three missions were uh, flyby missions. And we just so happened to look at boring places. We didn't see much. All we saw were craters. It looked like the moon. Uh, the other missions uh, were uh, orbiting craft, and those showed us much more. Um, with the orbiting craft, we saw uh, canyons, we saw volcanoes, uh, we saw glaciers, and we even saw dried up old river valleys. Uh, we, uh, we had a gap in our exploration after Viking. Uh, we didn't do too much until 1996. We launched the Mars Global Surveyor, uh, and uh, it had much improved cameras. It also had a laser altimeter. That laser altimeter gave us the exact altitudes so we, we learned a lot about the topography. Um, our real workhorse now is Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, it was launched in 2005. It's still going strong. Uh, its camera, called HiRISE, has returned tens of thousands of pictures. It also has a, uh, spect a spectroscope, which tells us about the surface composition. Um, Mariner 9 changed our conception of Mars. Uh, we saw things like this. It was like a, a river valley on the Earth. Uh, it was curved and it had all these branches. Um, and then later we had Viking and Viking found uh, very densely branched channels. And uh, these are the kind of features you get when you have rainfall. So uh, we saw this picture. We thought, well, geez, maybe there was rain at some time. Now, this is a, a large picture, large area. Uh, the uh, scale bar is 25 kilometers. So this is a, a very big uh, a network of channels. And again, this is what happens when you have rainfall. This is what happens when rainfall hits the earth in the mud. And I went outside after a rain, uh, the rain, and I saw the same kind of pattern, the uh, densely branched channels. Uh, this is a close-up uh, of uh, some channels. This is a high-rise image. I'll be using uh, a number of high-rise images. Uh, they are uh, five kilometers across. That's not really far. Most of us could walk across this five kilometers. Uh, most runners do a 5K in less than a half an hour. Back in my marathon running days, I could have ran across an area like this many times. So uh, th these are not really big areas, but the resolution is tremendous on this. Uh, you can enlarge parts of this and see things the size of a small car, even a, a kitchen table. Here's some more channels. Those are curved and branched. Uh, here's another ch set of channels. And notice this uh, channel goes down along and it goes this crater. This crater was once perfectly round and now part of it's been cut away. That's by erosion. So the stream eroded part of that crater. Uh, Viking found multiple lobe rampart craters, and they do not like, look like the ones on the moon. They have these lobes, and the edges of the lobes are thickened, just like ramparts. And they may be caused by an asteroid landing in ice-rich ground. The heat from the impact would make mud. That mud would splatter out to give you these kind of shapes. Uh, Viking also found regions of chaos. 
Now, with chaos, the, uh, the ground seems to just collapse, and you have all this water that comes out and makes large channels. Now, this is a pretty big uh, picture. Uh, the scale bar is 20 kilometers. So we have a, a lot of water coming out of there. Uh, here's uh, some erosion that's caused by uh, the water coming out and going in those uh, outflow channels. Uh, again, the uh, scale bar is 10 kilometers. So this is a pretty big scene. And uh, the edges of these, these formations, these scarps, are 600 meters. So it takes a, a lot of water to do this. This would be more water than any of the rivers we have on, on the Earth. Uh, here's a, a close-up view of some of these uh, shapes with the high rise. Uh, and the, the water goes, and, and you can tell what direction it goes by the, uh, the tail. It points to where the water goes. Uh, we saw many channels that seem to flow into depressed areas. So we have a couple channels here. They're going into a depressed area. And this probably formed a lake. And the, notice the, the floor of this lake, proposed lake, is smooth and it's level, just like you would expect for a lake. Now, you could compare uh, this uh, lake bottom to the area around it. It's very rough. So uh, this is probably a lake. Uh, we see uh, many examples of uh, channels that are connected to craters. And we think water flowed into the crater, made a lake, and then flowed out the other side. And uh, when we see this, uh, we know the, the crater was once full of water because what happens is the, the water goes in there and it fills up the whole crater and then it looks for a way to get out. And it, it looks for a, uh, a weak area or a, a low area in the rim and then uh, erodes its way through for a new channel. Uh, and this would be called a uh, open crater lake because the water is going in and going out. Uh, we're going to use this map for a while. Uh, this is uh, one produced by the Mars Global Surveyor with the laser altimeter. Uh, it uh, bounced a laser off of the uh, surface, and it timed how long it took the signal to come back, and it did some math, and we calculated the altitudes all over the place. Uh, so the dark areas uh, are the deep areas, and the white areas are the high areas. Uh, these white areas are the tops of volcanoes. Uh, we'll talk about some of the uh, lakes we know the most about. Uh, we know a lot about Gale Crater because we've been there. We've been there for years uh, with uh, the uh, Curiosity rover. Uh, we thought we'd go there because we saw these layers. When you see layers, uh, there's a good chance there was water there. Uh, layers are often formed underneath uh, water. Uh, and sure enough, we went there, looked around, and we saw layers and layers all over the place. Another lake we know a lot about is uh, Jezero Crater, because we are there. We are there with Perseverance, and uh, some of us heard a lot about Perseverance this morning uh, at another uh, session. And Perseverance is, uh, again, an open lake. The water comes in, makes a lake, and then goes out. And uh, with, uh, with uh, Jezero, uh, the river brought in the uh, water, and it has sediment. And when the river hits a quiet body of water, it drops its sediment. And that forms a delta. That's what, uh, that's what happens when rivers go into big bodies of water. Uh, we are excited about that uh, delta. We found clays and carbonates with the spectroscope. And uh, those uh, minerals are formed in water. And clays are really neat because they can preserve fossils and organic matter. Here's a uh, updated uh, view of that. Uh, again, we, we landed sort of in the middle of the picture there with uh, Perseverance, and then Perseverance traveled to the south and then to the west, and it gathered samples as it went along. It, it will return those samples to the Earth. The, the samples will be returned to the Earth eventually and for more study. And uh, I thought it was really neat. There was a, a paper came out just a few days ago. Uh, it, it talked about how Perseverance has really good cameras. And it, it looked over to different places. It went, looked over to uh, Kodiak Butte. And in Kodiak Butte, it found layers that were slanted and they were arranged just like with a delta. So that's more evidence that this was a delta. Uh, and uh, Kodiak Butte was probably part of a, a bigger delta here. Uh, the cameras also focused on the edge of the delta. 
And that was pretty neat there because they found these big boulders, some of them five feet in diameter. And to make a boulder, you've got to knock off the edges. And that's done by rolling down a, a river. So there was uh, once a, a lot of water coming down into this area. Another uh, lake we have is, uh, was in Holden Crater, and it has a delta, and we found clay in it. Uh, it's been suggested as a landing site for uh, several missions, but it hasn't made the cut yet. We probably will go there someday, though. Uh, and the great Valles Marineris probably had a lake. So Valles Marineris, as we probably know, was really big. It's, it was span all the way across the United States. Now, we, we, we know it had a lake, but we're not sure how big. It could have filled the, the entire Valles Marineris system, or it could have been just parts of it. And the overflow would have, would have went out and end up in the, the northern area. Uh, we have uh, some big impact craters. Uh, Hellas is the, uh, one of the biggest, and, or it is the biggest. And uh, it probably had a lake. Uh, we see these very big uh, channels that probably took water into it. We also see uh, layers again, these layers along the edge of Hellas. Uh, so it could have been made by a large lake. Um, another impact crater in the south is Arjar. Now it had a lake and that lake froze over, which is what happens in, on Mars, cold Mars. Uh, and then underneath the ice, there was glacial forms made. Uh, they found uh, things like uh, eskers and drumlins. The eskers were uh, once channels underneath the, uh, the ice. Uh, we have another uh, set of, we have another uh, uh, lake called Erdania. Now it looks like there's two of them, but that's the way the map is. Uh, Erdania is actually very large. It contains over nine, or it contained over nine times as much water as all the Great Lakes put together. Uh, another kind of crater we have uh, is a, uh, a closed crater lake. And Columbus Crater is one of those. So the water goes in and it didn't have an outflow. It just went in, filled it up, uh, and then ev eventually the water went down. And now as the water level went down, salts came out of solution. So you had these mineral deposits. And right now it has like a bathtub ring of, of mineral deposits around the edge. So we think over 200 craters held lakes. So that's a, that's a lot of water there. There's big lakes and little lakes, but also Mars may have had an ocean. It may have had an ocean more than once. And that ocean would have uh, covered uh, over a third of the planet. And that sort of makes sense if you uh, look at the topographical map, the, uh, the, the northern place where you have the uh, proposed ocean is very level and flat and low. So you would expect that waters would flow into the low area, flow into the, uh, the river, I'm sorry, into the ocean. And notice how in the uh, Southern hemisphere you have, uh, it's very rough. Uh, you have a lot of craters and there's, uh, there's different elevations. These colors tell you elevation, so different elevations. But in the North, you have pretty much all the same elevation and it's very smooth. And that's what you would expect if there's an ocean. Uh, we see uh, large outflow channels uh, that probably carried water from the equator uh, to the northern ocean. And um, now one would guess that if you have an ocean, sooner or later, you'd have some impacts into the ocean, and those impacts would cause a tsunami. And that tsunami uh, would affect the land and, and make some special features that we know are caused by tsunamis. We do see those. We see all these boulders sitting on top of high areas. Uh, this is the top of a mesa, and these boulders are the size of houses or cars. We also see backwash channels. Backwash channels are made uh, when the, uh, the tsunami waters carrying uh, rocks and dirt, they go upslope, and then when they go back, they make these backwash channels. Uh, we found some strange, strange terrain with the Viking. Uh, and with these pictures, they, uh, with Viking pictures, it looks like giant fingerprints. And we call it uh, thumbprint terrain. And for a long time, we didn't know what caused them. We, we came up with all kinds of explanations, and <clears throat> none of them are very good. But a tsunami could have caused them. 
Because you think uh, when you throw a, a rock into a pond, you get all these waves uh, radiating outward. And that's how a tsunami would be. Uh, we also see erosion on one side of these streamlined forms. And that's the side where the tsunami came from. Uh, now, uh, we do have a candidate that could have caused all this. If uh, Lomonosovo was formed when there was an ocean, the resulting tsunami would have made those features. And Lomonosovo looks like it was formed in water. It is shallow. It has a, uh, a wide uh, rim, and it's full of sediment. Moreover, it is the right size for that tsunami, and it's in the right position. So the evidence uh, we've shown for past water is channels, multiple lobe craters, streamlined shapes, lakes, and a tsunami. So where did the water go? Well, uh, we know a lot of it went into the ice caps. Uh, we have that all measured out. And we know a lot of it went into glaciers. We sort of know how much went in there. Uh, now, some was frozen to the ground. We're not sure how much. And some went into space. It was blown away by the solar wind. Uh, now, the, uh, the southern ice cap is three kilometers thick. And the northern ice cap is much larger in area, but it's two kilometers thick. Uh, the glaciers, we have several kinds of glaciers. Uh, this is one where the, the glacier is in the valley, it's confined by the valley walls. And then when it gets a chance, when it gets into a, a, a more uh, open area, it expands and makes a circular feature. And that's what glaciers do. When they have a chance, they, they spread out like this. Uh, we also have uh, other shaped glaciers. We have some that are uh, shaped like a tongue. So we call them uh, tongue-shaped glaciers. And there's a, a number of other forms with the glaciers. Uh, uh, Mars has a unique feature called lobate debris aprons. Uh, they uh, talked about it this morning in one of the talks. Uh, they form around mesas and they form around uh, mounds. Uh, radar has found ice in them. So we think they consist of uh, ice with a, uh, a thin covering of rocks and dirt that insulate the ice from the atmosphere. Uh, we may have found pingos. Pingos have a core of ice. That ice may be used maybe in the future with the colonists. Um, the, uh, the pingos first make mounds, and then sometimes they collapse and make this kind of a shape. Uh, Mars has wide areas of scalloped terrain. Uh, scalloped terrain has water frozen in the ground. One of the uh, areas that has a lot of scalloped terrain is called Utopia Planitia. And it's estimated it has uh, as much it has as much water as uh, Lake Superior, and that this water is frozen in the ground. Uh, uh, China's uh, rover is now crawling around this area, examining things. Uh, we found ice sheets, ice sheets uh, 100, up to 100 meters thick, uh, covered with only a couple meters of debris. Uh, when scientists uh, discovered these, they were really excited. They said, uh, "If you all you need is a bucket and a shovel to gather up all the ice you need. Uh, we have seen hundreds of new craters form on Mars, and some of them seem to have struck ice. Here we see uh, one picture, and then three months later, another picture where the, the ice seems to have disappeared. And that's what you'd expect on Mars. If ice is exposed to the thin atmosphere of Mars now, it, it goes right into the atmosphere. It sublimates. Uh, we were able to get a spectroscope trained on one of the bigger ones, and we did find a signature of water. Uh, this is pretty exciting. Uh, when Phoenix touched down, its landing rockets blew away a thin covering of dirt to reveal exposed ice. Uh, we also think that uh, Viking 2, if it would have dug four inches deeper, it might have uh, reached an, an ice level. <clears throat> now, there's a little bit of, uh, a little bit of uh, controversy here. Uh, if you see these little bumps and things on this landing gear strut, some people have suggested that these are droplets of water. They think that when the rocket motors uh, 
landed here and or went against the ice it may have changed some of the ice into water and the ice could the water could have splattered on these uh, these landing struts not uh, all scientists uh, agree with that but many do um, we have brain terrain scattered around uh, mars and it's uh, a lot of these features are in the mid latitudes we have the we have uh, the ice caps in the, in the north and south and then in the mid latitudes, we have uh, many other uh, places where water is frozen. Uh, brain terrain looks like the human brain, so we call it brain terrain. Uh, it has high areas and low areas. The high areas, uh, the the, uh, the ridges, they contain a core of ice. There's a, a close up of the uh, brain terrain. Would I always thought it'd be neat to walk around there? Uh, we have uh, mantle. Mantle smooths the surface. It falls from the sky, and it's ice rich. Now, uh, these many of these features, uh, they are very important because we may be going there to get our water supplies. We know there's a lot of water in the ice caps, uh, but ice caps are pretty far away. We usually try to land closer to the equator. Uh, so we may be in the future uh, going to places uh, like the mantle and the brain terrain, ice sheets, scalp terrain, pingos, low weight debris aprons and glaciers to get our, get our water supplies. Uh, what we'd probably do is uh, send a robot machine there to harvest the ice and purify the water and so forth, then bring it back to the, where the colonies are. Uh, perhaps we would have all that done before people actually land there. So we'd have the people would land and they have all these uh, water tanks all filled with water. And if you have water, you could, uh, uh, change the water into hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is a good fuel and oxygen would be good for breathing. Uh, now, a, a lot of the uh, atmosphere and, and the uh, water vapor uh, was blown into space by the solar wind. Now, in this diagram, uh, they show Mars to be bigger than the Earth, but actually we know that Mars is, is much smaller. So when the solar wind approaches the Earth, it can't get very close because of our magnetosphere. The magnetosphere is caused by our magnetic field. Now, in the case of Mars, uh, it does not have a current magnetic field. So it doesn't have a, a magnetosphere. The solar wind comes in there and strikes the surface and <coughs> takes away a lot of the atmosphere, including the water vapor. Now, when the solar wind strikes the upper atmosphere, it makes a uh, induced magnetosphere but that uh, induced magnetosphere is not very, uh, very strong. So we've seen the evidence for past water as uh, uh, channels, uh, multiple lobe craters, streamlined shapes, lakes, and a tsunami. Uh, now the, uh, we showed with the map where the lakes were and uh, the uh, multiple lobe craters are, and the streamlined, streamlined shapes and many other things are found uh, in the mid latitudes. They're scattered all over the place, basically. Uh, where the water go? We said the ice caps have some, uh, glaciers have some. Now, a, a certain amount is frozen in the ground and we don't know uh, how much. And uh, a lot of it was blown into space and we don't know how much. Some people would say that most of it was blown into space. Others would say most of it is still in the ground. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Okay. Yeah, I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, but yeah, if anybody has questions, you're welcome to write it in the chat and I'll read it. Uh, but yeah, Jim, one question that came to my mind as you're talking is, uh, is there any evidence of water on uh, either of the two moons of Mars, uh, Phobos and Deimos? No, I, 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 there's, there's no evidence that I know of. Um, and one wouldn't think there'd be any there because of the for very low gravity unless there's uh, some buried deep inside, it, it, those moons do have a very low density. So uh, physically you could have some froze pockets of it frozen inside, but there's, there's no evidence of the water in those uh, two moons. Okay, so I have a question here. Can we deploy Phobos for erupting Olympus Mons? Okay, would you say that again? Can we deploy? Uh, can we deploy Phobos for erupting Olympus Mons? So maybe that's to, to prompt an, an eruption, I guess. <laughs> okay, <laughs> like, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, yeah. 
Uh, I never, I never heard that. Uh, well, I guess anything's possible. I, I <laughs> never heard that. That's a, that's yeah. a pretty unique uh, idea. Now, uh, the, the, like Olympus Mons may have been active, they say recently, but it's, it's been millions of years probably. So the, the magma there may not be uh, too close to the surface. If we knew that magma was pretty close to the surface, we could probably do that and yeah, get, get volcanic eruptions. And with volcanic eruptions, you get a lot of uh, water vapor and gases coming off. Okay, another question is percentage-wise, how much water existed on Mars compared to what there is on Earth today? Well, that's a good question. Uh, let's see. You know, some that's uh, that's up in the air. Uh, some people I'm would here, say yeah. pretty close okay. to. Um, hopefully, I'm not interrupting. Sorry for interrupting. Can I ask what the the main purpose behind this research is? Is it to look into a possible source of mining, uh, a new water source, or is it looking to sort of make a substantial sort of basic basis to look into whether carbon-based life forms were capable on Mars or in a sim similar environment in another uh, planetary system? Uh, well, let me, I'm not sure if I understand the whole question, but uh, my intent here was to show where water can be found today, like for colonists. So when we go to Mars, we would want to know where the water supplies are. That's that's a practical aspect. Now, also, you could say, well, if we knew where the water was, that would be a place to look for for life. They always say follow okay, the water. Okay, so. that's answer my question. Thank, thank you. Um, so is it main the main purpose is to look for uh, to utilize a, a new source of water. Possibly for colonists, or would it be could it be exported back to Earth, or would it be purely for resources for colonists to Mars? Well, that that water would be for probably used mostly on on Mars. We we seem to have a lot of water already on on Earth here, uh, but if you have colonies like we like to have, uh, you would need a supply of water. And with like we said, with with the water, you could take it apart and and get hydrogen for fuel and they have the oxygen for breathing. So we find water, that's, that's a pretty good deal. Okay, brilliant, great, great to know. Thank you, thank you for your time. You're welcome. Yeah, and back to that, that theme about, oh, yeah, we have two minutes, by the way. So yeah, but that theme about location, uh, where is a location that we think we will have easy access to water? That's a good question. We're, we're looking in, uh, it, it's, they're found all over. So we have to kind of look where do you want to land and then look for something that's close? And you have to consider a couple of things. One is um, closeness and another is uh, what do we have, where do we, uh, what do we have to do to get there? So maybe, maybe, maybe there may be water real close, but you have to go through rugged terrain. So you may want to go a little bit, a little bit further away to get, go through terrain that isn't so bad. And then some of these things, um, that you might have to dig down deeper for the for the ice. Uh, and some of the some of the places there might be a lot of water, but it's if it's in the ground frozen, uh, it might have a lot of salts in it. So you'd have to somehow purify it. So there's a lot of things to consider. Uh, first off, is we we know there's lots of water or lots of ice all over the place. Okay. Another question is: uh, Do we know how much off gassing there is from the surface of Mars? Um, okay, we, no, I don't think we, we know anything about the outgassing right now. It's probably very low, but we have been studying a, a lot about the, how fast the water is leaving the planet. So we, we study the atmosphere and we study the hydrogen coming off of the uh, atmosphere and we could get an idea of how much is leaving the planet. But how much is outgassing? I don't know if we have any idea of how much is outgassing. It, it uh, pretty much is all frozen. Uh, we have a uh, we have numbers, very low numbers for the humidity, and we have very low numbers for the uh, the, the amount of water is there. But it's going to be a, a very small amount of outgassing. That's a, that's a good question. I don't know if we've considered that that much. Yeah, and. 
So it's now at the top of the hour, so new workshops are starting. But uh, if you like, Jim, we could uh, continue with some of these questions and uh, audience members could continue listening to these questions or go to other workshops. Okay. Uh, are you okay with that, Jim? Yes. All right. So uh, another question then is, could we build atmosphere with a new magnetosphere? How long might that take? Oh, boy, that's, a, that's, that's going to be tough. Um, um, it's, that, that sounds like a, like a terraforming uh, question. Uh, and it would take a long time, I think, a real long time. I'm talking about maybe you know thousands of years probably doing it that way. Uh, we would probably end up more more so uh, just having these little um, cities around with, with domes of them or something, or be underground. But uh, it would be pretty hard to uh, make a magnetosphere and uh, and then wait for the uh, uh, wait for the uh, the water to appear. Now, I guess if we had an advanced civilization, you know, millions of years ahead of us, now maybe they could do something. It's beyond us now, though. Okay, so then which of the features you listed would be the best choice to locate an early hab and would continue to supply well into the future as the hab grows? Um, again, we, we're not, like, we, we need some more information about uh, uh, how much water is in things like uh, the uh, the mantle layer? Uh, that may be easy to obtain with a with a uh, uh, a robot, but then ag then again, uh, we might find sources where, uh, like with a lot of these, a lot of the water is frozen in the ground and it has a cover. Now that cover, some places it might be very hard to dig through. It might be very thick now the ice sheets they said there's there's only a couple of meters of debris so that might be one of the best sources there again we're, we're mapping all these places out and uh, uh, we may probably need some data from the ground to see how hard it is to dig into the ground to get the ice the, the ice is going to be pretty hard it's going to be about like rocks because it's so cold there yeah then back to that topic of uh inducing an eruption at Olympus Mons. <laughs> uh, can we detonate a bomb on Olympus Mons to activate it? Yeah, well, I could. We have, uh, we have a lot of uh, nuclear weapons and stuff, so we have a lot of power for that, I'm sure. Uh, but again, the, uh, we're not sure how, where that magma chamber is. It, it could be many miles deep, like maybe 50 miles, 100 miles deep. So that would be pretty hard to get to with nuclear bombs. You might do a lot of destruction uh, to get down there. Now, if we know the magnet chamber is maybe a mile deep, then, you know, maybe that would be possible. But it seems like uh, uh, Olympus Mons and those volcanoes have not erupted uh, for, you know, a long time. Uh, we did have um, one mission that had a infrared spectrometer. And it looked for hot spots. It looked for areas where there might be magma close to the, the ground. And we didn't find any. So if, if there was magma moving fairly close to the ground, uh, we would have seen it with the, uh, some of our probes. And then uh, would causing Olympus Mons to erupt uh, release a lot of water? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a, yeah. And uh, the Olympus Mons and, and all those volcanoes, when, when they erupt, they, they release a, a great deal of water and they release a lot of carbon dioxide and uh, methane and a lot of chemicals. But most of what they release is water and carbon dioxide. So you get those things erupting, you can get a lot of, uh, a lot of new atmosphere. Okay, yeah. And that's all the questions we have then. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank oh. you all for being here. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Okay.